This happened 12 years ago. I'm now happily married with three children and regret absolutely nothing. I was with my now ex for three years. I had noticed that she was being extremely controlling. I was expected to give every little detail of my day and tell her my schedule in advance, and if I deviated from that, she would be very upset. She chalked it up to just bad feelings she was having and shrugged it off as her paranoia for past relationships of infidelity. I had never once cheated or strayed, and I never gave her a reason to act like this. It felt unbecoming of my fiancé to act in such a way. Now this is where it gets juicy. After she had asked for my schedule to make plans, as mine tends to be more hectic than hers, I noticed she was texting someone. In my line of work, if I put in more than 40 hours, I have the ability to take time off at will as long as the work is completed at a later date. I was very good friends with a brother and still am. We laugh about this to this day, and he actively reminds her of it. I messaged him stating I wanted to do something special for her a little bit earlier than our anniversary to make sure it was a special surprise. They both worked in the same fabrication facility. He was a fabricator, and she a shipping manager. He was kind enough to let me know her schedule. That's where the discrepancy falls into place. Without my knowledge, she was foregoing overtime. She worked 12-hour shifts Monday through Friday, with the exception of Wednesday, when she would only work half a day. She had been taking Wednesdays off right around the time that she started getting extremely controlling. Lucky for me, I had stacked several days of leisure time up, so taking a Wednesday off for me was not an issue. A few days go by, and Wednesday's here. I put on my work gear and leave for work. I was expecting her to leave as our apartment complex had two exits on the same road I could see directly across from a shopping center, so I parked my car near the back and waited. After about an hour, I noticed a very specific red Mustang with a specific decal on the back window. It was her cousin by marriage. I had also done my due diligence to take an old laptop, which we kept on our desk in an office area with a full view of the living room, bedroom door and bathroom plus the kitchen. I had set it up for remote access and had it alert me when the webcam noticed movement. Giving her the benefit of the doubt, I thought he may be dropping something off or coming over to assist her with something, as her family sometimes does. Sure enough, a message came through so I remote into my laptop. He walks through the door without skipping a beat, she unbuttons his shirt and begins kissing him. I created a URL link for the live stream. And as she was preoccupied, we had a family group text and a friend group text. They were both part of it, but at the current time, they were currently indisposed and didn't look at their phones. They didn't even wait. They could have gone to the bedroom. But no, they decided to get freaky deaky right there on the couch. I sent the link off to the friend group chat and the family group chat. Within minutes, I'm getting calls nonstop from friends and family alike. There was no turning back. She was getting blown up, but she was ignoring her phone. Not until the fourth or fifth call came through did they decide to take a break. For context, the state I live in allows recording of personal property regardless of occupancy. I was the only one on the lease. She wasn't allowed to be on the lease because of poor credit. The call she had picked up was from her cousin's mother who she was banging. She answers the phone on speaker, and I kid you not, the first words out of his mother's mouth were stop fucking my son. They both became rigid and she began to stutter over her words, saying, What are you talking about? Etc. The mother then divulged that there was a live feed of them sent out by me to her family. She grabbed every pillow off the couch and covered herself up. The cousin staggered off, trying to put on his pants and shoes, just to trip himself up and bang his head off of my coffee table, leaving it with a divot. By this time, I had made my way to the front of the apartment complex. I was there to greet the adulterer as he came out of the front exit. He froze and began to cry, apologizing profusely. I'm not going to lie. What happened afterwards wasn't my best moment, and I nearly got into legal trouble if it weren't for the fact that he was trespassing on private property. Let's just say I had a cast for six weeks, and he wasn't in any family photos for months. I went up to the apartment, where she was now fully clothed and crying inconsolably. I asked her if it was snot or man juice on her face. Then I told her not to answer because it didn't matter anyway. I gave her one hour to remove all her belongings, as again, everything in the apartment was mine except for clothes, some makeup, and a few kitchen utensils. Her mother would not let her move in, as she was just filled with embarrassment. Same for her brothers, and the cousin's mother kicked her son out. Rumors spread around our town very quickly, and for a lack of better words, she was untouchable. Story 2, 
town forced to bulldoze new development after building on land they don't own. At the end of World War II, thousands of troops were heading home, starting new families, and wanted to move out of the city. There was a major housing boom all around the county. People couldn't move out of the cities fast enough, and developers could not build home fast enough. There was a ton of money to be made in the construction business, which led to some underhanded building practices. One such practice was starting construction before the land acquisition was finalized. Enter my grandfather, G. After serving as a pilot during the war, he came home to a very different town. When my G went off to fight in 1942, the town that he described leaving was tired and worn down. But to his amazement, the town he saw stepping off the train in 1948 was anything but newly paved roads, a traffic light, and new homes. New homes that just went on and on. He actually got lost on his way back to the family farm due to the new main town road being rerouted while he was away. But what took him by surprise the most was the new development being built on his childhood friend, John's tree farm. This was surprising to him, mainly because he knew how much the farm meant to John and his family. The farm went back at least two generations. But my G just guessed that the developer made John's family an offer too good to refuse. However, that thought was shot down later that evening during his welcome home dinner back home. It was my great-grandmother who tipped him off that something was off. He couldn't recall exactly what she said, but it was something along the lines of, Oh, I just wish John was still alive to be here. My G nearly choked, not because of the news, but because John was not dead. He was still in Hawaii. My G had gotten a postcard from him not but four days before. Turns out while John was off in the Navy fighting in the Pacific Theater, John's dad had suffered a stroke and passed away, and his mother passed away less than a week later from a broken heart. More than likely, John was never informed of their passing, and now twenty-plus homes were being built on their land. My G about ran out of the house, jumped in his father's Model T, and raced down into town to send one bombshell of a telegraph to John in Hawaii. John your folks passed. Farm now being built on. Come quick, G. My G never got a response back. He figures that John must have fainted from shock, then jumped up and ran to the Navy base to get on the first boat home. Because he was back home in less than four days, and he was mad. According to my G, when he burst through the doors of the mayor's office, everyone in the room looked like they were about to drop dead. The poor desk clerk was fumbling over his words, trying to talk to John. Then, the mayor came out of his office to see what all the commotion was about. As soon as he saw John, he went white as a sheet, then ran back into his office and locked the door. Getting nowhere at the mayor's office, John went to the next town over and hired a lawyer. What followed was a seven-year court case that ended in the mayor being sentenced to eight years in jail and the developer going bankrupt. Turns out that after John's parents passed away, John wasn't able to be contacted for some reason and was just assumed dead. So when an out-of-state developer wanted to build homes in the area, the mayor just permitted them to start building on John's farm. For a hefty kickback. Of course. Also, because of John's lawsuit, the developer couldn't finish the pre-sold homes. Which ended up in more lawsuits. In the end, the mayor and the developer and the town ended up having to pay John close to $45,000 total, which is over $752,000,000 today. And then the farm had to be returned to its prior condition. To say John was happy would be a vast understatement. Today, John's tree farm is a nature reserve, and the story of the corrupted mayor is all but forgotten except for by a few locals. John passed away in 1999. My G has been back to his hometown a few times to visit his grave and to check on the old tree farm. Story 3. Don't kill your neighbor's dogs. My crazy, antisocial, elderly aunt lives in the mountains of West Virginia. My aunt is a mean, bitter old woman who was suspected of shooting and killing her ex-husband, but the cops could never pin it on her. Years ago, she bought a small home on some land that borders the land of another family in a small, narrow, isolated, forested mountain valley. The other family had been living there for a long time, and they just wanted to be left alone, like most people who chose to live in a remote mountain location in West Virginia. My aunt bought chickens and started to let them run around, unfenced on her property, and the neighbor's dogs were very interested in those chickens. The chickens would roam around and go over onto the neighbor's property. One day, without warning she killed her neighbor's dogs for killing one of her chickens, and only one of the dogs was killed on her property. The other one was shot dead in the neighbor's front yard. 
The neighbors had small kids and they loved those dogs. My aunt walked over with a shotgun and told the neighbors that they had better never get another chicken-killing dog again or else she would kill them too. The neighbors didn't take too kindly to her killing their dogs, and her actions with the shotgun, waving it around and threatening them was over the top. But they didn't call the cops, knowing that my crazy aunt, who had a reputation for being violent, was unlikely to be arrested, and if she was arrested, she would just quickly be released from jail and be back. So a couple weeks later when my aunt went into town, her home's back window was broken, and a bottle of burning oil and gas was thrown into her home. By the time the fire department finally arrived, the home was a complete loss, and every dog and possibly ex-husband killing shotgun and firearm my aunt owned, along with all her other worldly possessions were incinerated. The home was a total loss, along with the chicken coop etc. The neighbors didn't see nothing and the sheriff's department couldn't prove anything. My aunt had a long list of enemies. She didn't work and so was too poor and lazy to have homeowner insurance. So she had to move, and her son eventually bought her a cheap, run-down trailer in town. Story 4. Grandma's Revenge I was visiting my grandma and grandpa to celebrate a bunch of summer birthdays together, but when I pulled up to their house, the plot to the right was completely empty. As in no stones, no base, no debris, just slightly overgrown grass. Grass, where there used to be a house. When the hellos were said and the party started, I absolutely had to know what happened, so I went to ask my grandparents, and goodness gracious I was not expecting the roller coaster of a story they told me. A couple of years ago, my grandparents had some very unpleasant neighbors. Loud at all hours, trash in the yard, arguing with other people on the street, just absolute nuisances. It was a husband and wife, and their adult son who would come and go irregularly. The wife would get into arguments with anyone about anything, and the husband would physically intimidate the people who spoke up for themselves. They weren't sure what exactly was the deal with the son, but it couldn't have been anything good as it was well known he had been in the county jail more than a few times. The house apparently reflected the tenants, as it looked awful. It was sagging and dilapidated, loose beams and peeling paint, but nothing was ever done about it due to the guy who rented out the place being a slumlord. We'll get to him later. It all came to a breaking point one night when my grandparents returned home to find their back door smashed in and some of my grandpa's guitars missing. Now grandpa loves his music, and has been singing and playing his whole life, so it's safe to say those guitars are not only very memorable to him, but damn expensive too. They of course went to the police, and after some digging they found that the guitars had been sold at a pawn shop or someplace by the sun. They couldn't get the guitars back unfortunately but I believe my grandparents were fairly compensated since the guitars were insured. Given how expensive the guitars were, the theft was absolutely a felony and the son once again ended up in jail. After that, the neighbors would harass my grandparents through the fence or on their porch, meaning it was difficult for them to even sit outside. They would call them foul names, throw trash over the fence, and the husband would still try to get physical. Now while my grandpa is a very chill and mellow guy, my grandma will take shit from noon, especially not jerks like these. So what did she do? She got the house condemned. It was easy for her to do, really. She called the local authorities, general attorney? Property manager? I dunno, and they came and did an inspection, though it was clear by the outside of the house that it hadn't been properly maintained for a long time. One call led to more calls, and the property was deemed unfit to live in, which forced the rude neighbors to move out. I'm not sure what happened to them or where they went, but supposedly they were put up in a nearby hotel by the slumlord until the house could be fixed. Oh, foreshadowing. Now enter the slumlord. Of course his tenants told him who had reported the house, so of course he's upset with my grandparents. Rather than fix the house though, he gets aggressive the first day he's there, yelling at my grandparents about how they're idiots for reporting him, and how they've cost him a bunch of money, and he's gonna sue them and on and on. It gets to the point where the across-the-street neighbors call the local police to come defuse the situation, which they do. A few weeks pass and my grandma hasn't seen the slumlord or anyone around to fix the house. Not being one to let things go easily, grandma starts making frequent calls to a bunch of services, reporting the house and its lack of progress. Each time, the slumlord's truck would appear for a day, and then leave without changing a thing. Grandpa said he would block in their driveway but since they stay home most of the time, it wasn't a major issue. Grandma disagreed. Finally, my grandma had complained enough that officials came out and condemned the house for demolition. This had two major effects. First, the rude neighbors were now practically homeless, 
since as soon as they and the slumlord ran out of money to pay for the hotel, they'd be stranded. Second, the slumlord still had to pay a shitload of fines for the state of the house. The rest is more his fault than my grandma's actions, but he would refuse to pay and refuse to show up in court, leading to a warrant being put out for his arrest. A few months ago, the demolition teams came and tore down the place, leaving the lot perfectly barren. They even removed the driveway, so now it just looks like an extension of the side yard. My grandparents were not sure of the final state of the neighbors and slumlord, but my grandma looked very pleased with herself as she finished her story. I love her so much.